Hello, and welcome to another episode of For the Love of Sports. My name is Michael Raziel. This is a show where we get to talk about sports, we get to talk about business, and we get to talk about everything in between. Wherever you're listening, however you're listening, you know exactly what to do. If you're on YouTube, you like and you subscribe. If you're on Apple, you give us a five-star review. If you're on Spotify, check out the video Spotify. We got it. Let's take advantage of it, right? But more importantly, today... My incredible guest. I have Sue Enquist. She's a former softball player and coach at UCLA. She's also the first All-American softball player at UCLA. She helped lead the team to their first national championship in 1978. She's a six-time Hall of Famer and the only person in NCAA softball history to win a championship as a coach and as a player. Sue, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. A pleasure is all mine, Sue. Again, six-time Hall of Famer. I... I didn't know there was that many Hall of Fames. I, why aren't you in 10 yet, actually? That's my question. My first question to you, Sue, why haven't you made it to 10? <laughs> I'm still working on it. I Hopefully, in my second chapter, maybe I can do something profound. Who knows? I love it. You've done a lot of profound things, Sue, and I think it's awesome. <laughs> so, Sue, I'm very excited to talk to you today. Thanks again to TIA for making this happen. I'm very excited to talk about the partnership they have with expanding Title IX and getting people to understand exactly what it is. But, Sue, this is the For the Love of Sports podcast, and the first question I have for everybody on the For the Love of Sports podcast is, why do you love sports so much? Oh, where do I start? I good, good, good question. You know, I for some, I'm 64, so people can do the math that when I was young, girls weren't allowed, didn't have opportunities or access, and I was fortunate to have an older brother, and that was my introduction to sport was through Little League. And fortunately for me, I had somebody that turned and pulled me in and gave me access to participation. So for me, it was belonging. I fell in love with sports because it was the first opportunity for me to belong to my people, to, to other boys that love sport. And it gave me a sense of value. It gave me a sense of accomplishment. It tested me. And through that small ball and that softball, I was able to see the world get a free education and craft a foundation for my second chapter to be the fun zone. The fun zone. I like that. And I think it's important, right? And that's one of my favorite parts. And I always love asking that question because I always get a different answer. And it's always, you can see it to the core of someone, really why they got into this crazy, crazy world that we live in. Because... <laughs> When you're when you're on and you're you're the one working, I'm I'm the one at home watching, right? And that's that's right. always the thing about sports is it's very difficult to wrap their heads around and and the opportunity for you to as you said have all these incredible things happening to you, but you've been in a in an incredible position with UCLA over the last X amount of years where you've had the opportunity to show this to other people. So what's it been like being able to shape and and help countless women and and I'm sure some men along the way too in some way shape or form? to just show them all the things that sports taught you. you. What was that like to be able to pass that on? Well, I think really for me, it's just a full circle moment. I was a student athlete, assistant coach, a co-head coach, a head coach, an administrator, and now I teach graduate school at UCLA. So I'm in a full circle moment back dealing with high performers in the classroom, both academically and athletically. I think the joy comes from now that we have science and our culture is now doing the research that says sport is a great contributor to great health and a longer life. And what better way to do it than have this foundation in your youth, in your formative years, to have competition be a part of it and have sport be a part of it. Because then you can always have this mindset of staying active. And we know staying active is really important for longevity. Yes, I go on walks every single day. That is my activity. And I, my wife and I, we started to pick up tennis. Uh, we're not very right. good, but it's just something to do. Oh, and I play beer league softball. I know it's not <laughs> quite the same level that you used to play at, um, but believe me, I can hold my own out on the beer league field. But no, in sincerity, I completely agree with you. There's so many great things. And, and, and again, going back to the longevity of you've been able to help and, and, and touch so many people in different ways. I'm curious from your perspective, right, being in um, the NCAA softball for so long with Title IX, obviously, this is this is shaping the conversation for us. Being before it, during it, and now, I don't want to say post-Title IX, but like even becoming more aware of it. What are some of those changes for the positive and potentially the negative that you've seen from your time being in this sport? Well, for, first of all, I think it's important to just lay a, just a, a simplifying blanket around Title IX is, you know, in my opinion, it's probably one of the most important uh, federal mandates that we've had probably since the right to vote 
for women. And at its simplest form, Title IX is a, a federal law that says boys and girls get equal opportunity for education and activity. And no one ever thought back in the 70s that this education bill was going to be the foundation and the impetus to provide equity and equality for uh, men and women in sport. And any entity that's getting federal funds must comply with the standard of Title IX. That's the good news. The bad news, we have very few people that are in compliance with Title IX. So it's pretty simple. Boys and girls should be able to have equal access to education. Boys and girls should have equal access to sport opportunities and access. Now, remember, what a lot of people don't know, Michael, is Title IX is setting the standard based on the attendance gender of the school. So a lot of people don't realize this, that how it starts is if we have 52% female in the school, not student athletes, in the school, then we must be sending, spending 52% of our funds and access and opportunities to reflect that, um, that population. So to me, that's hugely important because we need to be telling the world we're not in compliance. We're celebrating. We celebrate the progress because it always, for my world, it always gets really popular every 10 years. And then it gets quiet again. And so for me, it's the greatest thing that's ever happened, but it's also a story that's not over. And we need to start becoming more and more accountable everywhere we are in education around Title IX. Why do you think it's a 10-year kind of cycle like that? Like, what, what, is, what is happening every 10? Is it just politicians being politicians, or is there maybe something more that you've seen? No, I think it's just society loves to celebrate uh, on the zeros, right? Let's celebrate the 10th, the 20th. And it's just a cultural thing. It's not, I'm not necessarily, you know, pointing out, oh, the, this group is wrong because an opportunity to celebrate is an opportunity to expand. And not only in access to education, access to a sport and activity, but what about how we are not equal in our retirement dollars? There's even, uh, as a representative of TIA, is this idea that we're not even in retirement. We're still not being treated equally. And we retire with, gosh, less than 30% of our male counterparts. So Title IX is a huge rule, but it's one that we just need to put more teeth into it. And I know we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's so... I tell my wife all the time, it's it's got to be so frustrating. Like, what have I done that makes me so much better? Like, I, I don't like I don't get it. I sincerely, Sue, I do not understand it, and it frustrates the hell out of me. I could only imagine, I could only imagine what you and many other women go through just to hear things like, like and it just doesn't make any sense. And honestly, I just don't get it. And you know, what what can we do as just advocates as as allies that just like hey let's let's push this because it seems like because as you were explaining exactly what title nine is and, and you've even educated me on some of it that is something that while it happens in college it's obviously going to have extremely long-lasting effects out into the public universe for years and years and years for all of these women that get these incredible opportunities what can we do man like well, that's just, it's but, so frustrating i think the first thing we could do at, at a national level is what if we flip the script and we said we're going to start celebrating the high schools and the colleges and even the state parks that are getting federal funding. And we're going to start celebrating them. We're going to start labeling them. Oh, here's X school. And they are at 100% of Title IX requirements. Imagine if we started rating and ranking, because as far as I know, on the, on the books, I don't know of one entity that had their federal funds taken away because they're out of compliance. And so what happens is people don't realize most schools are out of compliance, whether it's a, a junior college, whether it's division one, two, three, four, and you're like, oh, but what about this conference? They're doing all these great things. But are you giving access and opportunities equal to reflect the student population on that campus? That's number one. What can we do? If you're a dad with daughters, you're going to be a part of activities that have females involved. Is it fair? Are you getting fair access to the fields? Are you getting fair opportunities with the equipment? And be the person that has a loud voice. Just start asking questions as a mom or dad with a daughter that's suffering from this inequality. If I am a current student athlete in college, 
go ahead and start paying attention to, are we getting equal opportunities for everything? And if you're not, raise your hand and ask your institution about how that can change. Go to the media, put it on social media. You know, we've had some really viral events in the last couple of years just by student athletes saying, oh my gosh, I'm here at this postseason championship. We're getting this little thing and look at the men are getting that little thing, that big thing. And so big the idea is around awareness, around advocacy. I think for the greatest compliment we can give Title IX right now is many of our student athletes in college, they actually feel pretty excited about the things that they get. They haven't gone through life being greatly discriminated because they've had an opportunity for scholarships. They have a competitive schedule. They have uh, public transportation that takes them from the university. But imagine being somebody, I, I was here before Title IX. I mean, Michael, we wore at UCLA. I mean, this is a perennial national championship program. I was a part of 11 national championships at UCLA. But I want to share with you the story before the championships, before we had Title IX. I wore the men's track team practice t-shirts as game uniforms. It's that stuff. Like It's that kind of stuff. It's that and, kind of stuff. That's ridiculous. And what happened? We had an athletic director that said, Title IX has been uh, put into place. UCLA with our chancellor, Charles Young, said, we are going to go all in with our female athletes, and we're going to give them opportunities, money, budget, travel, everything, and we're going to be first out of the gate. People always ask, UCLA's women's athletics is so profound. Well, we got out of the gate first. It's amazing what can happen when you give access and opportunity. Yeah, I feel like if you're just compliant with the law that's in place, more great things are going to happen, right? Diversity is is it should be encouraged all of the studies that have ever been done that said the more diverse a university or an education or uh, an organization is the better that organization tends to become because of different stories and experiences that come from different people that are then I, allowed to tell and it, it's incredible and i wish i think was hard i love the nc2a i first want to say that i am so indebted to what nc2a what espn has done for softball i first want to say that but being a good friend and a loyal friend, I'm also going to be an honest friend to the NC2A. It's very difficult to ask an entity to self-police itself. And until we have a third party that's going to come in and say, hey, we're going to go ahead, nuts to bolts, evaluate everybody. Well, the problem is who's going to pay for that? So who is the person at the end of the day? It's that student athlete, male or female, if you're being discriminated against, we've got to amplify that voice. Moms and dads, we need you to raise your hand and say, why is this happening? Because there is no better time now than your sons and daughters. They have a voice. The student athlete has a voice in today's society. And I think it's a great thing. We just need to know what we need to amplify. And that is, are we giving equal opportunity to men and women in everything that we're doing around sport and education. And you, and you alluded to the story a little earlier. I, I want to say it was the women's basketball team from Oregon. Uh, yeah, University NC, of Oregon, yeah, right? Yeah, when they, when they sent that, oh, I can't remember. I apologize. I forget the athlete. The, she's amazing too, but she sent out the picture and said, this is our gym. And it was just a single like weight rack. And like, I have like a single weight rack here in my basement where I am and the men's, and then they took the picture and it's like this immaculate room that has everything that you could ever think you'd need and more. And that spurred some, some, obviously some conversation online that spurred some uh, eyebrows raising understandably. And then I think I want to say Nike or somebody stepped in uh, and or tonal or Peloton, one of those companies. And they just said, Hey, take all this stuff. This is all yours. It's free of charge, which is awesome. That is great. But it shouldn't have had to happen. That is the problem. There was no reason that needed to happen. Who in their right mind saw that and was like, yeah, this is enough for, I don't know, 100, 200, 500, however many athletes this is. They get a single weight rack. This is going to be great. Like, of course, that was going to come crashing down. And thankfully, it did. And as you said, like the voices, social media now, NIL, NIL is huge. And the opportunity that comes with it is is going to be incredible for these athletes that, that can be advocates of something like this. It's just, you know, and shout out companies like TIA for helping out a little bit, right? I think that's pretty important. Uh, you and, looked like you had a story. I apologize. Well, no, no problem at all. I think what I want to share with you is 
I know so many administrators in the NC2A. These are amazing people. They're not behind a black curtain saying, hey, let's see how we can go ahead yeah. and pull one over. What, it, what we have in general is the mindset that we do what we've always done. We do what we've always done. If we do what we've always done, we're going to be what we've always been. And that whole concept holds back and allows discrimination to thrive. So a better question to ask is, have we connected all resources and is everybody on the same page in terms of equality? If anybody is on any project management group, any council, any committee that is going to do or build something, the first question not is, what did we do last year? Let's copy it. No, let's go ahead and look at both genders first. Well, I don't know the people over on that side. If you're in sports, everybody knows everybody. If you're in sports, everybody knows everybody if you're on a committee. And so for me, I don't have a lot of patience around, well, it's not my fault. I just did what we've always done. We can't say that anymore. Let's go ahead and start reaching out and let the number one question be, are the boys, girls, men and women, are they equal? And if they're not, what are the steps that we're going to take to make sure that we create that equality? How do we get there? Now, I think that's a million dollar question, right? Because I think if we, we've been asking that question for this long, at least in the public eye, and as you said, every 10 years, this is an exciting conversation we get to have. And hopefully we, hey, if it's baby steps, that's fine. Clearly, we need to continue to do whatever we're doing to get in that direction. But I 100% agree with you. How do we get there? Um, I would love to say something outside the box. How do we love get it. there, right? How do we get there? We've got to think so outside the box. We've got to start recognizing the schools that are doing it right. We've got to recognize the schools that are in compliance. I would love to have a third party consortium come together. Think about the people that are just wrangling us right now. So in terms of efficiency, I mean, I would love, like, imagine if we said to Amazon, Hey, Amazon, you kind of have a thing going. You certainly know how to be doing all your business. Why don't we put a consortium together for the next five years to be evaluating? Let's just start small. Let's just evaluate college sports and college and high school sports. Let's just start right there. Give us five years and let's see where we can. We've got to think outside the box. We can't keep asking the NC2A if they think they're in compliance. It's just we're going to be do, going in circles. I live probably 20 minutes from Princeton University. And Princeton University puts out the Princeton Review every year. And every year you can find out who the top 10 party schools are. Right. Find it hard to believe they can't do something who the top 10 schools in compliance with Title IX, right? So I'll call out Princeton. That's an easy one, right? That's almost too easy. I apologize for that. But, like, it's simple things like that. Like, we can find out who the best party schools are, but we can't find out the schools that are just in compliance with a federal law that's been enacted for, I don't know, 50 years at this point? Yep. I, I and, and, you know, not to burrow down into it so much, but the – the athlete is understanding that it's not equal, but she doesn't really know what to do about it. It's just literally drop something on a post, tell a friend, don't think big like you have to redesign the world, but just start sharing information because with social media, it is the new megaphone. It, it has its positives and it has its negatives. Then what happens? We've got to start educating her when she gets to college. We have to, you know, you know, you remember, Michael, when you go to college, you have an onboarding, right? Mm -hmm. And they tell us about all kinds of stuff, right? All the things that, that are important to the university, right? Why aren't we telling them, hey, we just want to let all the women know, all the freshmen, we just want to let you know right now, you're only making 80 cents on the male dollar. Why don't we start telling them that? when they're in college, so they can start building awareness around equal pay for equal work. And then when we're in equal pay, equal work, and now we're in our 20s and 30s, we can start telling them in the onboarding of employment, oh, and you're also going to be 30% down in your retirement income. Imagine if we just started building, you know, reading, writing, and retirement as a part of the equation as you're moving through the progression of your life, then when you become my age, you're able to, to thrive. You want to thrive in retirement. You don't want to be just like, oh, I'm surviving on a fixed income. We don't want to be those people. Women are planners. We're organizers. And we've got to look at retirement the same way.
Couldn't agree with you more, Sue. You got me all fired up. Now I want to start a business and, and do this. Can you want to? How about this? You and me, we'll do this together. We'll uh, we'll call out the Princeton review. Maybe we'll do the Mike and Sue review. How's that sound? That, that's uh, right I'm, to it. I'm all in. I am all in. Anything I can do to amplify these issues around equity, equality, retirement, retirement, and opportunities in the workplace, I'm all for it. Yeah, and last question I do want to ask. I mean, shout out again, TIA. Thank you so much to them uh, for put, bringing us together. What is it like to be able to work with a company that has the same passions as you? Again, bringing this to light and just trying to make, again, the awareness factor is the, the first step. So what well, is that like being able to work with them? I mean, just knowing the, the resources that they have and this idea that we're going to go ahead and build a campaign as a company. We're going to build a campaign around inequality. Not only inequality with Title IX, but the inequality that's happening in retirement. I mean, I, I come from a family of teachers, and I know that TIA is really, um, really has served that industry well. And I'm also the daughter of a military father that taught me the value of saving. And I literally made pennies my first year. And my father's like, I don't care. You got you to save 25% of that. And just little tips and tools that you can gain by bringing somebody in. I mean, TIA offers free financial coaching for people. So whether you're 20 or you're 60, just get on the phone and get a plan because after all, we're planners. And if you become a good planner, then your chapter two, which I'm in, can end up being the fun zone. The fun zone. There it is again. Sue, this has been absolutely incredible. I really appreciate it. Is there anywhere we can go maybe to find out a little bit more about the partnership between TIA and, T and what they're doing with Title IX or anything more about you that we can learn? Well, I mean, you, you can just find me. Just type my name, Sue Enquist, on the internet if you need anything. Um, it was pretty easy to find this information about <laughs> you. I'm not going to lie. But just through TIA is probably the quickest way. They've got a wonderful website, easy to navigate. I just love the fact that there's no shaming, right? Just get in there, get a, a financial coach, let it, let them look at your your savings. It doesn't matter if it's a hundred or a thousand dollars. That's where we get caught up as women is, mm -hmm. oh, I don't want to talk about it. Oh, it's so far off. No, start now so you can have fun later. Like literally yes. if you're 23 years old or you're 43 or 63, just get a quick financial, uh, get your financial t temperature taken taken care of so you can be ahead at the end. I love it. For the kids out there, compound interest. Look it up if you don't understand what exactly. that means. No, again, one more time, Sue Inquest, a legendary softball coach at UCLA, a legendary player. Sue, I sincerely appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.